Well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, April 18th service uh, with Community Bible Church of Lincoln, uh, broadcasting from Plains, Montana. And uh, I hope everybody's having a good day, had a good week. We've been going through the Gospel of John, and um, we've learned quite a bit about Christ and his ministry, the uh, the opposition that the, the Christ faced from the scribes and Pharisees, from the religious uh, leaders or the religious kingdom uh, of Israel at that time, and also from the, uh, the secular kingdom of Rome, the conflict of kingdoms. Uh, it was very strong and active during the time of Christ, and it's still active today. And today we're going to uh, start a new uh, series. We're going to get out of the Gospel of John for a little while, but come back to it uh, to finish up what we have not been uh, covering there in chapters 13 through 18 or uh, 17. But for now, we're going to think about kingdoms uh, for the next month or so. Today's service uh, message is going to focus on the mysterious kingdom of Christ. Or else you could look at it maybe as an introduction to the mystery age uh, of Matthew chapter 13. But kingdoms have always captured man's imagination. Uh, look at the world of, of the ancient Greeks and Romans and, and other cultures. Uh, there were dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of gods and goddesses. Zeus, Hercules. Uh, think about even more modern times, the, the land of Oz, in essence, is a kingdom uh, with munchkins, right? And he had a good witch and, a, and an evil witch. Um, uh, also, Narnia, the great uh, chronicles of uh, C.S. Lewis, the books, the chronicles of Narnia, or maybe even uh, J.R.R. Tolkien, and the, uh, the uh, trilogy, The Fellowship of the Ring. Some kingdoms are good, some kingdoms are not so good. You think about kids, children, most, most kids, they, they love fantasizing about kingdoms, being part of a great and noble and powerful kingdom. And, and most kids, they want, they want to be the prince or princess or king or queen, right? You think about it, we call our daughters and granddaughters uh, uh, our little princess or princesses. But it's the dreams we have for our children, for people to be loved, to be happy, to be prosperous and and so it's good to think about uh, life and, and sometimes as a kingdom. And, you know, who, who would dream and desire that their children would, would grow up to be uh, uh, a, a prince or a princess living uh, in the land of Mordor under the rule of Saran, the evil one? Or you think about why have the Marvel movies proven so popular? It, it's, a, it's a kingdom. It's victory of uh, good over evil. It's that kingdom motif. Well, in the Bible, we have uh, kingdoms presented from the beginning all the way up and, and to the end of the Bible, to times yet to come. Uh, the, but the Bible, we have the true story of a man and, and, and kings, and of one eternal king, one immortal king, uh, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, in, in the Gospel of John, we have um, that we've been in Christ the King is risen, and he has ascended into heaven. So now what? You know, people wonder, what's the plan? What's the goal? Uh, wh where, where is history going to? And uh, is there a plan? And I think the Bible definitively tells us there is a plan. Uh, and people like knowing the plan. I, I sometimes get in trouble. I want to know what the plan is all the time. What is happening? And will we be successful? If you think about the, the plan that, that Jesus has left us uh, at the end of John, the, he's ascended into heaven. Uh, of course, the first chapter of Acts talks about that more. Uh, but, but if you look at the ends of all the Gospels and the beginning of the book of Acts, uh, components of the plan, Acts, Matthew, and Mark specifically say, spread the good news. The commission, the great promise of Christ to be with his people, to empower his people, we have... Uh, the, this authority and commissioning as part of this kingdom plan. Uh, Mark and Acts specifically talk about the ascension of Christ. Uh, Matthew and Mark, the charge to baptize uh, th those members of this kingdom, uh, as Matthew 13 would say, the mystery kingdom, you could almost say. 
And Matthew and Mark also obedience is commanded. What kingdom can thrive without obedience of the subjects, right? Uh, Matthew, as I said, his presence with uh, his people is promised. In Luke and Acts, we see as part of this kingdom that God's children are part of, uh, followers of Christ are part of, we, we see uh, uh, his presence with the people and, and the promise of the Holy Spirit. In Luke, at the end of Luke, uh, Christ reminds us that all the Old Testament prophecies uh, have been fulfilled in Christ. Well, well, maybe not all the prophecies, but the prophecies of Christ have been fulfilled, the bulk of them, the majority of them, in, in the first advent. And John, at the end of John, we've seen restoration of Peter. Three times we talked about that. Three times Peter is, is uh, in a sense, uh, mildly rebuked, but also shown love and affirmation by the king, the king of kings. And, uh, and all kingdoms have, have to have a component of restoration in them uh, so that the subjects can live in harmony with the king and fulfill their mission. And John, we see the follow me command. Uh, every kingdom, we must follow the leader, so to speak, just like the little kids game, follow the leader. And we also see that uh, faith is needed. We do not have all the plain de details of the plan, but in the book of Acts, we're, we're told to have faith at the beginning as the disciples uh, looked up uh, and saw Christ ascend into heaven. In Acts, we al also see the promise and power of the Spirit given again to the people. And in Acts, the return of Christ is foretold. The disciples were curious about the plan. They had been with Jesus for over three years. And uh, they learned uh, in, in the itinerant ministry that they had to trust the plan of the king, of, of Jesus. Because I don't think he laid it out. He didn't have a morning briefing, I'm sure, and said, hey, boys, here's what we're going to do today. But like, uh, like, uh, like the disciples, uh, we live in chaotic times, and it's hard to know the plan. It's hard to see what is the plan, what is God doing in this world in which we live. And it's normal to ask what is going on. Uh, Matthew chapter 24 and 25, they give us some understanding of things about this plan. Matthew 24 and 25, these are... Uh, Several chapters in the Bible that, that have uh, given rise to much confusion in the minds of people. There is, um, uh, it's easy for people to misinterpret uh, these sections of Scripture. Uh, and, and just like with all Scripture, when we come to the Scripture, we have to interpret what has been written. We have the Bible in our English language. It has come from, from Greek. It has come from uh, a bit of Aramaic. And it has come from Hebrew. And so we've had to rely on experts in the ancient languages to interpret these words, to translate these words, and, and uh, allow us to understand what God's plan is. And when it comes to interpreting Scripture, it's so important that we, we interpret things uh, consistently. And, and I think the best way to interpret Scripture is not to do an allegorical interpretation like, like many uh, do today and have for centuries, where you spiritualize everything. A good rule of, of interpretation is if the literal sense makes good sense, seek no other sense. We have to inter interpret the words of Scripture in their normal gr grammatical settings. Um, we have to look at the sense of words. We have to interpret figures of speech. The Bible, God has given us the Bible uh, in language for people to understand. So there's figures of speech in there, like, like the rising and setting of the sun. We know the sun doesn't move. Uh, the earth moves. But the Bible speaks to us in normal, everyday language. Uh, you have to take things in context. Uh, when it comes to prophetic passages of Scripture, you have to look at and realize that sometimes there is a, a near application or, or, and, and uh, fulfillment in the time of the prophet or shortly thereafter. And sometimes there is a secondary f further uh, fulfillment of prophecy. And it takes a careful student to recognize the differences so you don't get confused. And you have to think, th remember and, and think about the progressive revelation of the scriptures. God gives us 
1,600 years, or he has taken 1,600 years and used over 40 different men to give us his word. So there is progressive revelation. The, the writers of the New Testament had a fuller understanding than, say, uh, Moses did, or, uh, or Adam when he, when he uh, possibly penned the first uh, chapters of the Bible. And you have to look at genre. Is it prophetic? Is it a is it is it is it future prophecy? Is it uh, is it historical narrative? And so as we come to these sections of scripture, we have all these things that, that we have to consider to properly understand them. Matthew twenty four, I think, is very fitting. That the uh, Jesus comes out of the temple, and as he was going away, when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him, he said to them, Do you not see all these things? But truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Jesus here is reminding his disciples that buildings and man-made things are temporary, and that they do not last. The kingdoms of this world do not last. The only kingdom that lasts is the kingdom of God, or sometimes referred to as the kingdom of heaven. And as he was sitting, chapter, or chapter 24, verse 3 of Matthew, it says, As he, that is Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen? When, when is this temple going to be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? And that's a very uh, important word here, the end of the age. They were curious about, what is your plan, God? What is your plan, Jesus? When are these things going to happen? Verse 3 is the key. We have, and, and as we would look into chapter 24 and 25, and, and we'll get to those in the weeks to come, but, but this is a key question, and we're asking that same question today. When are these things going to happen? Where are we at on the prophetic timeline, God? How close is it to the return of Christ? Is there really going to be a seven-year tribulation period? Is there going to be a rapture of the church? Will there be a, a literal thousand-year reign of Christ? And, and the way I interpret Scripture according to the rules I gave earlier and the way uh, many, many, many scholars over the years and common people have interpreted Scriptures, the answer is definitively yes to those questions. There will be a rapture of the church, a parousia. There will be a seven-year tribulation where God's going to work in and through uh, the nation of Israel in fulfillment of what is called the 70th week of Daniel's prophecy. And so here in, in Matthew 24, we have signs of the end of the age in verses 4 through 18. And then in chapter 24, verse 29 through 31, Jesus talks about signs of his second coming, when he's going to come back. And the, and the second coming is interesting because I believe there's really, a, in a sense, a two-stage second coming, the rapture of the church and the return of the Lord in glory at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And then there's teaching illustrations in chapter 24, verse 32, down through chapter 25. And this section of scripture gives uh, people a lot of problems and there's a lot of confusion because of inconsistency in how they interpret the scripture. But the end of the age is a big question. Like right now, if you were sitting across from me, you would say, I would say, is the end of the age something that's important to you? Do you are you curious to how close we are to Christ's return? And I guarantee you every hand would, would rise and every head would nod an affirmation. And so when the disciples are talking, what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? What age are they talking about? What time period? You know, the, the word age has to do with time. What, what period of time are we talking about? Is this the church age? Because uh, right now, as Christ is teaching his disciples, it is not the church age, the beloved, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is yet in the future from where we're at right now. This is not the church age. And we're under the period of law. Christ is living under the Mosaic law. But it's not, but, but this age you're talking about, is it all of the laws and all of history? What is it? The age Christ is, is referring to, I think, uh, is, is something that many people have not heard of, at least in, uh, in this term. But it is a mystery age. It is the mysterious kingdom of Christ. 
or, or in essence, this could be an introduction to the mystery age. And it's, and it's not mysterious, like spooky, but it's a mystery. It's like something that's unknown. It's a mystery age of, of which the Bible has, is silent until Christ reveals what this mystery age is. It encompasses the time between Israel's rejection of their king in Matthew chapter 12 and the second coming of Christ in Revelation 19.11. And if you've never heard that before, I hope you'll consider that and think upon that. Because that is a key thing to interpreting this, this section of scripture and, and Matthew 13, the parables of the kingdom. It encompasses a time, this mystery period between Israel's rejection of the king in Matthew 12 and the second coming of Christ in Revelation 19.11. Beloved, we are living in the church age, but we're also living in the mystery age. And this mystery age is, um, is a time of great miracles. Christ did many miracles. The disciples, the apostles did many miracles. Occasionally, God still breaks in and, and circumvents the laws of nature and performs great miracles of healing and, and, and doing various things to people. But it's also a time of great faith. It's a time of great heresy. It's a time of great heresy, apostasy, and turmoil. But this mystery, a biblical mystery, is a scriptural mystery or truth that it must be revealed by God. And that is so important. If, if there's a mystery in the Bible, the only way we can know about it is if God tells us about it. Let's look at a few mysteries here in the Bible. Colossians, if you would, turn to Colossians chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. This section of scripture, Paul talking about uh, Christ. And he's talking here about Christ's commission to Paul. And Paul, he, uh, he's, I'll, I'll, and I'll start reading in verse 24 to give context. It says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake and in my flesh. I do, share, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church, I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, so I might fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. And here's where I want us to pay close attention. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested or revealed to his saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory, the, the rejected Messiah, still reigning, still ruling, still working, even though he is absent uh, from earth in physical form in his own body. This mystery among the Gentiles, Christ, this church age was a mystery age. They did not understand that. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2. So... It said, Paul says that your hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. And here he explains that mystery we just talked about, that, in Christ, that is Christ himself. Jesus Christ is, is the mystery revealed, the, uh, the incarnate Son of God, the King of Israel, come to earth, rejected crucified and ascended into heaven, but yet still ruling, still reigning. And then also Colossians chapter 4, verse 3. Paul again says, Praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up us to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I also have been in prison. Christ is a mystery to the unbelieving. To, to, to those who uh, have not been blessed with understanding and enlightenment, uh, people who have been blinded by the kingdom of darkness, as 2 Corinthians 4, 4 tells us, Satan has blinded people. Satan is head of a kingdom, an inferior kingdom. Christ is head of a glorious kingdom. And also, you can turn to Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Paul, talking to the Romans, says, I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation. 
that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved just as it is written. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will not. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I will take away their sins. This mystery here is the mystery of God setting aside the nation of Israel during this period we call the church age. He has not lost or, or forgotten Israel, his beloved covenant people. God has made unconditional promises to Israel that are yet to be fulfilled. But in this mystery age, Christ has, in, in his earthly ministry, turned to the Gentiles, uh, pri primarily after starting with the Jews. And in the church age, uh, the gospel is going to the whole world. And so Christ is not done with Israel. He's going to return. That's the 70th week of Daniel. And then also Romans uh, 16, 25, we see this idea, this mystery again. It says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God. And he has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith. To the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. Again, Paul's talking about Christ and the church age and this gospel as a, as a mystery, how God is dealing uh, with things. And then last but not least, we'll go to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7. Paul again talking about the idea of, of, a, of a scriptural mystery. For the, and he talks here about, For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So in Paul's time, the mystery of lawlessness is at work. And now here in Thessalonians, he's talking more in a prophetic sense about lawlessness and, and is, is, is referencing... Uh, the tribulation period and the antichrist so these mysteries these things we would not know if christ had not if christ had not revealed them through his word if god had not revealed them through his word god has got a plan beloved and we're part of that plan in this mystery age in mark chapter 3 verse 22 and 28 through 30 uh, also talk about that and we'll look at those briefly Matthew, Mark, Mark chapter 3, verse 22, and this corresponds with Matthew 12, about when the nation of Israel formally rejected their king by ascribing to the works of Christ to the, to the power of Satan. In chapter 3, verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. That is a serious charge. That is, Christ came in fulfillment of the prophecies. He did the miracles of, of the Messiah. He had the birthplace of the Messiah. He had the lineage of the king through David. And he shows up. He performs all these miracles and fulfillment of prophecies, a light to the Gentiles. And they say he casts out demons by the ruler of demons. And Christ says in verse 28 of Mark 3, Truly I say to you, all sins shall be given the sons of men, and whatever blasphemes they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin, because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Jesus here is basically saying, when you ascribe my miracles to the power of Satan, and you're telling me that I am the devil, that I am possessed by a demon, that is blasphemy. Heresy is, uh, is false teaching. Apostasy is, is, is falling away and rejecting false teaching. Blasphemy is when you basically utter condemnation towards the, the person and work of, of Almighty God. So now what's going to happen? This was what we just read in Mark and what Matthew 12 talks about, a parallel account, is about 16 months before the cr cross. Now, at this point in this message, you may be a little bit confused and confused about this plan. And if so, don't worry, you're normal. 
when you study these things out, it gets confusing. You have to spend time. But we don't have to be uninformed or ignorant about God's plan, beloved. We must, however, seek for it and, and look for it. This mystery age is a time of worldwide evangelism. It's a time of Israel's rejection. It's a time of Gentile uh, belief. Gentiles being grafted into the body of Christ, into the kingdom, so to speak, as Paul talks about in Romans, into the covenant promises. We're in a time of fulfilled prophecy of Israel even being redeemed yet. Romans chapter 11. The Bible tells us, and the, the, the parables we'll be looking at in more detail next week, talk about a time of great contrast, contrast, great conquest, great conflicts, and great conversions. It is a great missionary period, but it's also a period of great heresy. And as I said already, heresy is any belief or theory that is uh, at variance with the established belief or customs or teaching of the Bible. An apostasy is... is uh, explicit renunciation of one's religion principles or cause it's it has to do with false religions it's a time we live in of the cross the christ and and, and at some time in the future the antichrist if you wonder why things are so messed up in our world beloved it's because in this age the conflict between light and dark is intensifying it is moving towards the pinnacle the ultimate uh confrontation that will occur at the end of the tribulation period. In a sense, it peaked at the cross, but it's going to peak again. Uh, this age concerns kingdoms. We started out talking about kingdoms, God's kingdom, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of heaven. Our Jesus is king of the kingdom of heaven. Never forget that. He has the lineage to be king, as I said. Matthew and Luke tell us that. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 and chapter 9 are two prophetic scriptures that tell us that we have a glorious king. He is a wonderful counselor. He is the mighty God. He is the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. He will be virgin born. Micah 5, 2 tells us he'll be born in Bethlehem. And there are so many more prophecies we could point to. But the miracles of Christ cry out, Son of God, King. Revelation describes this Jesus as King of Kings. He is our King of Kings. We looked in Mark, but Matthew chapter uh, 12, verse 24, we, again, we have the formal rejection of the King. It says, When the Pharisees heard this, they said, This man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. That just makes the hair on my neck stand up. But today we have people saying that Christ is, is a myth, Christ is a fantasy, Christ is a crutch, religion is foolish. They are blaspheming the, the power and the person of Christ as much as the Pharisees did. And up until this point in, of time in the book of Matthew, Matthew, the, the tax collector, the, the, the traitor to the Jewish people, people turned uh, uh, chronicler of Christ, and one of the disciples, one of the first church apostles. When you read the rest of Matthew, no longer does Jesus say the kingdom of God is at hand, but the kingdom of heaven. And, and I wouldn't get too dogmatic on that and, and, and too worried about it, but it, it's a subtle shift in the way Mac, Matthew documents Jesus is making a turn and, and God is making a turn in history to, to an to a age, to a time period, to a working that the people did not understand. They've rejected God's plan. You think about it this way. Israel was going to enter the promised land at Kadesh Barnea. They sent in the spies. They came back. They decided, hey, we're not going in. We can't do this. It's, they're, they're too powerful. So did God just kick them to the curb? No. He said, but for 40 years, you're going to wander until all, all the uh, men 20 years and up are gone, and then not, you, you enter the plan. He, he gave them, a, in a sense, a time out. And that's where Israel is at again. When they rejected Christ's miracles and said that is the power of Satan, they ascribed this to, to Satan uh, the work of Christ. They've been in time out, beloved, for almost 2,000 years, but that doesn't mean God's forgotten about them. 
Two thousand years is nothing to the to the one who inhabits eternity. This postponement is is really from our perspective and not man's. So God knows what's going on. God knows what's going on. So Matthew thirteen. I have it in my notes to read the whole thing. I don't know if we will or not. There's there's quite a bit there. But we might just read part of it. And I would encourage you to read all of Matthew 13. And and, and as you read this, think about, you know, what the question of, of Matthew 24, 3 was. Uh, where it was, tell, tell us, Lord, when, when, when are these things going to happen? And what is the time of your coming? Matthew 13. That day, and this is the day when the Jewish leaders, the same day they had said, hey, your, your power is not of God, it's of Satan. You're a tool of Satan. So that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat, sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables. And, and, and speaking in parables is, is so crucial because those who had ears to hear, those who you might say could be among the elect who, who by faith would be elected into the, this kingdom, this mystery kingdom, uh, they had ears to hear. Parables were designed to shield truth from unbelievers, from the opponents. But for those who had ears to ear, hear, who had faith like a mustard seed, as we'll read about, uh, God was going to do something. He was going to reveal himself to them. And, and the Holy Spirit was going to open up their understanding of who Christ was, who he is, and what he expects of his disciples. He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And, he sowed some, and, and as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depths of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched because they had no root. They withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples came to him and said, Why do you speak to them in parables? Jesus answered, To you it has been given, it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been granted. For whoever has, to him more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has shall be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because while seeing they do not see, while hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. You will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes, because they see, and your ears, because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. And then Christ goes on to explain to his disciples, those who have ears to hear. And I find that sad. A large crowd, many, many came out to hear and see Christ. Were they looking for miracles? Were they looking to be fed? You know, we don't know, but obviously Jesus was not impressed with the large crowds. Large crowds are not always a sign of, of God being present and working. Now, that doesn't mean he can't work in large crowds and groups, but here is just a prime example of Scripture that this mystery kingdom, this work that God wants to do, that Christ wants to do, that the Holy Spirit is, is, is yearning to perform in the hearts and, and lives of people, is, is a mystery. It's an internal thing. It's not, in, it, it's, it's not with numbers. Numbers matter, but that's not the key. Like Christ says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm in the midst of them. We're indwelt by Almighty God. One of us matters. Each of us matters. And then Christ goes on to explain that parable, and, and we'll come back to that next week. And then he goes into the wheat and tares. He says, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. 
But while those men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went away. That's interesting. You know, what's going on? The kingdom of heaven, we got a man with good seed and an enemy sowing tares. And then we have this mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed down in verse 31. Which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree. So the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And then we have the parable on leaven. And Christ goes on and teaches wheat and tares. Verse 36 says, He left the crowds and went into the house. His disciples came to him. And again, they said, Explain this parable, the, the, the tares. Uh, and, uh, and then to his disciples, he, he has three more parables. The hidden treasure, the pearl of great price, and the net. You know, the people in Jesus' day, they wonder what was going on. What was going on? This guy, we listen to him, he makes no sense. But we're going to follow them because we might get something out of them. The disciples had earnest questions. You know, it's the same way today. Many people go to religious services. People go because, hey, this group will pay my rent. They'll pay my bills. They'll buy me a car. They'll put food on my table. All those things are important. But I've known of many people who go to different religious groups and organizations who, uh, who claim to be Christian but uh, are, are far from it because their teaching is, is like the uh, scribes and Pharisees. It's, it's full of error. And, uh, and once they quit getting their needs met, they disappear. Okay? They're not born-again people from the biblical perspective, and they certainly don't follow the tenets of the religious system, the man-made religious system that they uh, follow. But they go for the benefits they get. Christ wants us to come because of love. Honor the king, worship the king, serve one another in love. That's why Jesus, throughout his ministry, said, Follow me, follow me, following after Christ. It, it's a, it, it concerns the things we do, but it's really a matter of the heart. It's just, you know, the, the Christian faith is, is a mystery faith in some respects, a mystery religion because it's faith. The world clamors after works. You look at the religious systems in the world that say, hey, if you do this and that, um, you go knock on so many doors, you go kill so many people who don't ascribe to what we do, you give so much money and then, and, and uh, you beat your body, you do this and that. People love, people love works religions because you can see something, you feel like you're contributing, but that's not what God's about. He's about our heart. He's about this, the, the, the mysterious workings of the spirit with man's spirit and conversion. So you ask, what is going on? You know, so how does this all fit, Dave? How, how does this scriptural thing, how does God's timeline fit with, with as we live in this crazy COVID world with, with, with conflict? We have conflict everywhere. You never expect to run into conflict when you go to the supermarket, but if you don't have a... a the, a mask on or wearing it the right way there's conflict we well, you know the conflict of the world when, as we look into the these uh, parables of, of the kingdom Matthew 13 and, and even also look into 20 Matthew 24 and 25 I think we'll have some answers because we need answers I want us to I want to challenge you and challenge me to evaluate which kingdom are you a resident of are you a resident of the kingdom where Jesus is king are you, are, are, are you uh, subscribe and, and uh, profess allegiance to some other kingdom? You can answer that question. Hebrews says our citizenship is in heaven. If you're part of this mystery kingdom, if you're part of this Christendom that truly follows the Bible, your citizenship is in heaven. There's no mystery to it. The Bible is very clear because it tells us by faith. You are saved through grace, and that none of yourself. It's a gift of God, none of works, lest anyone should boast. Oh, if the, oh, if the false religionists of the world could grasp Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and then add verse 10, because you, once you get saved, then you're God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he's 
uh, ordained or planned out that you should do them, that you should walk in them, the King James says. So the question I'll, I'll leave you with, does Jesus know you and are you following him? You know, many religious people praised Jesus, many religious people cursed him and spit on him. Both thought they were doing the will of God. Jesus says, follow him. So how are you doing on that? You know, you think about King Jesus. He's the only king that asks for your obedience. And you may find that surprising, but think about it. Earthly kings do not ask for obedience. What do they do? They demand it. They demand obedience. They require it. Jesus asks. He just says, follow me. All earthly kings demand it. But to follow Jesus, uh, as he says it in, uh, in one of the episodes of The Chosen, which I hope you've been watching, Jesus tells uh, a man, he says, I ask a lot from my disciples, but from those who don't follow me, I don't ask anything. If you're a disciple of Christ, he's going to ask a lot of you, but it's well worth it. We must choose to follow him for salvation and service, beloved, because... Uh, as we're going to look about uh, in, in, the, in the parables to come, if we don't follow Jesus, choose to follow him for salvation, for service, and out of love, judgment's coming. Judgment's coming. And we don't want to see anybody go to that lake of fire, to that place where uh, torment is forever and ever and ever. It's chapter... Uh, 13 of Matthew, verse 49 and 50 says, So it will be at the end of the age, at the end of this mystery age, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period, the angels will come forth and take out the wicked from among the righteous and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is a horrible place to go. I pray that if you have not asked Christ into your life, that today would be the day when when Jesus says, follow me, you'll say, yes, Lord, I will follow you. Thank you for listening, and may God bless you today.